As you gaze upon this grand property with its stunning gardens and architecture, it holds a dark secret. You see, it might well be love for its beauty, but inside those walls lurks a secret of an unsolved double murder and the spirits of the victims are said to haunt the many corridors. Today, we will dissect the fascinating and sometimes dark history of Lumber Baron Inn in Denver, Colorado. It all began with John Mewitt, a Scottish immigrant who decided to move to Denver in 1873 at the age of 25. With hard work and dedication in the lumber industry, he managed to build himself a reputable business called John Mewitt Lumber Company. After helping to transform the rough mining town into a respectable urban area, building over 200 properties, in 1890, John decided to give himself a home that would reflect his status. Using supplies from his own mills with a different type of wood featured in each room, he created what many would consider a work of art. But when his children grew up and there was only him and his wife left, the home had become too large. And so in 1915, the, the decision was made to sell up and move to San Diego, which is where he died. The new owners were the Fowler family. Hiram Fowler was a successful miner and known for his love of children, letting the neighborhood kids play in the mansion's ballroom with the many toys that were there, including his daughter's dollhouse and toy plane. But his kind-hearted ways did nothing to help him when he started to have financial challenges in maintaining the mansion. After many attempts to bring in money from turning the mansion into a business school and other commercial efforts, Lumber Baron Inn was divided up into 13 apartments. Sadly, while the Fowler family tried to maintain the splendor of this property, the neighborhood had also taken a turn for the worse, only adding to the mansion's misery. If they'd sold the property while the surrounding area was doing well, things might have been different, but the family held onto it until 1990. While the property was being used as apartments, in 1970, it was thrown onto the front page of many local newspapers after a double homicide took place. Cara Nosh was a 16-year-old girl who had big dreams and a strong sense of independence. After dropping out of school and her parents fearing she would disappear from their lives, she moved into one of the Lumber Baron Inn apartments with the help of her parents and a friend who she was sharing the expense with. Their room was situated on the third floor of the building, in what is now the Valentine Room. After many run-ins with dubious people, she told her parents while celebrating her 17th birthday that she wanted to graduate from school and go to art college after. With this in mind, she decided to move out of her apartment in four days' time, while also starting a job that her father had helped her to get. Now, if you're wondering what type of crap went on inside the apartments while Cara was living there, it certainly raises eyebrows and gives you an insight into how bad things were and the saying the grass isn't always greener on the other side definitely springs to mind. You see, the ballroom on the third floor was often used for drug parties with people in attendance that you would do anything to avoid. They might have been other residents or maybe there were guests of people living there, but you can imagine the fear this gave to the young girl. Once, Someone broke into her small room with a knife, stealing many possessions valued at around $280. Now you might wonder what the Fowler family were doing about the crime going on inside their property. The answer to that seems to be nothing. They didn't appear to screen any of the tenants, didn't try to stop the parties happening, even though it was known what was going on. And not once was the protection of their tenants considered by doing simple things like installing better security. Maybe if they had, Cara and her friend might still be alive. Early Monday evening, the day after her birthday party and big announcement, a man broke into Cara's room yet again, but this time she was home. She fought him as best as she could with a kitchen knife, but sadly he overpowered her, raping her and then strangling it to death. He then hid her body beneath the bed. While all this horror was unfolding, her friend called Marianne Weaver, a mother to a small child who lived nearby with her parents, decided to check in on Cara and it seems she walked in on the killer. Instead of fleeing the scene, this man decided to shoot Marianne in the head execution style and left her with her hands folded over her chest. It's believed by police that it was an attempt to fool authorities into thinking the crime scene 
was a drug deal gone wrong. The Denver Post had the headline on October 13th, 1970. Teen girls found slain in Denver apartment, which as you can imagine, made the Fowler family furious. This was bringing the property into the public eye under a bad light. And instead of taking her on the chin, they decided to shame the 17 year old girl with what appeared to be lies. Not only was she labeled a hippie who liked to take part in wild drug parties, but said she was to blame for her death as well as that of her friend. And let's be honest, that's a low blow. Eventually, it does seem that they shared some of the blame for the deaths and hopefully they learnt from their mistakes. The killer of these two young ladies has never been caught and it might well be the reason that their spirits are believed to still haunt the Lumber Baron Inn, still seeking justice for their short lives being destroyed. Many staff and guests over the years have reported witnessing the two girls' spirits as full-bodied apparitions in the Valentine room, in the hallway and on the stairs. They will also make their presence known in other ways too, with strange noises and unexplained cold spots. Kirk Mitchell of Denver Post Crime wrote an article in October 2014 discussing the cold case, where Cara's father Richard said, she was independent. It got to the point where we felt, rightly or wrongly, that if we didn't allow her to do so and not go along with it and not stay on good terms with her, that she might possibly run away and then we wouldn't know where she was. According to the same article, Walter Keller, the owner at the time, said that he had had an encounter with the spirit one evening in 1993 as he was cutting tiles for a shower near the Valentine room. He said he felt someone standing over him, watching him work, so he turned around expecting to see someone there. Instead he saw no one, but felt an otherworldly gust of wind hit him, making the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Also, during two paranormal investigations at the property by the same group, Spirit Paranormal, the name of the killer was said to have been given via EVP. Sadly the name has never been released to the public, but hopefully if there is any truth to it, an investigation can be made to see if the name brings any answers. Maybe if someone is finally held accountable for their deaths, Cara and Marianne can find peace at last and their families can find the closure they deserve. A tip hotline number for this case is in the description below. But don't think that these two poor souls are the only ones haunting the Lumber Barrett Inn, as there appears to have been spirits lingering here for quite some time. The first is a woman who is said to be dressed like a flapper, seen in the ballroom. No one is completely sure of her identity, with some thinking she's perhaps one of the old family members, or maybe even a friend dressed for a 1920s style party. Again, if you get the chance to encounter her spirit, she will appear as solid as you and me. One member of staff was taking down chairs after a play that had taken place at the property when he suddenly heard something moving around at the back of the room. As he turned to gaze in that direction, he saw a woman walking very quickly away from the area. Now there was only him and his wife in the building at the time, so suspected. His wife needed something, so went off to find her. But when he did, you can imagine his shock to discover she'd been working in the kitchen for some time and not left the room. So who is the flapper lady? There have also been sightings of a black, female maid in uniform who even in death still goes about her day carrying on with her chores as she did in life. Maybe she loved the place so much she couldn't leave. Or could it be she doesn't know she's dead? And talking about deceased staff, there is a male spirit who again has been seen as a full-bodied apparition walking and talking around various rooms of the house. People are unsure if he is an old family member, a male servant or even a teacher from when the building was being used as a business school. Now if you smell the strong aroma of tobacco and no one is around, the likelihood is you are picking up on the essence of the next spirit. It is thought he might well be a former owner of the property or an administrator of the business school. Either way, he is often seen walking around the first floor common rooms smoking on his pipe if he decides to let you see him at all. Have you visited Lumber Baron Inn and Gardens? If so, did you experience any of the supernatural goings on that are said to happen here? I would love to know in the comments below. As always, until next time, dissectors, stay safe out there.